So we've come to the end of the discussion about streams and parallel streams. We'll see a few other uses of streams when we talk about completable futures next, but I want to wrap up the discussion of parallel streams now. And we'll kind of talk about the pros and cons of using parallel streams. So first, the good things. As you've hopefully noticed, and you'll also see this when you do the assignment, the parallel stream implementations will almost always, not always, but almost always, uh, be faster and more scalable than sequential solutions using streams or loops. We talked in the previous discussion about when to use and when not to use streams and parallel streams, that there are some circumstances where they don't give you a speed up, but for most realistic programs, they will. And you can see here, just from the illustration of the performance results, the synopsis, that the sequential streams version was substantially slower than the parallel versions. No surprise, really. How much of a speed up would you get? Well, it really depends on several factors. So how large is your input set? The bigger the input set, all things being equal, the bigger the win from parallelism. How much work do you do on each of the items that you're processing in parallel? Again, if it's more processing, you'll get a bigger win from parallelism. Um, people sometimes, you know, come up with analogies. If you, if you have uh, a bunch of people over, let's say you have your family over for a holiday dinner and you've got, you know, eight people in your family. Um, for a small table, it might actually not be a big win to have everybody, you know, sort of concurrently bussing the table, right? Taking the stuff and putting it in the sink. You might have a lot of contention and people running into each other and it might easier, be easier for one person to do it all. If you were to have a, like a wedding or a, a banquet or some big event with hundreds of tables, it will definitely be faster to have that done in parallel than to try to do it sequentially because the cost of trying to coordinate all that stuff is going to be hopefully minimized relative to all the parallel processing that would happen. So once again, n times q is an important model to remember. Uh, it's not perfect, but at least gives you a heuristic that's worth thinking about. Another factor that matters is the number of cores. If you don't have any cores, then you're not going to get a big win. If you have a lot of cores, you're going to get a bigger win. Here's some other things that are not performance-related issues that are important to keep in mind. So apps that use parallel streams often don't need any explicit synchronization. You don't often need to have locks in them at all. Or if you do, they'll be minimal, like in your, in your collector, for example, your concurrent collector. Uh, and there also will be no explicit threading. And there'll also be no explicit calls to the fork join pool. Uh, all that stuff is pushed down. So that helps to alleviate various inherent and accidental complexities of concurrency and parallelism, because you don't have to worry about those lower level mechanisms. Often it's the case that any locking that you do need, for example, to access the file system or to access the occasional shared data structure or a collector or an immutable result container, et cetera, those things can also be easily handled by built-in class libraries in the Java class library that have the locking done implicitly. So you don't have to worry about it. So for example, using concurrent hash map or using some kind of concurrent queue or concurrent map or concurrent list or whatever. Those are all things that may help to alleviate the need to know how to protect the shared state. Obviously, you have to know how to use those containers that are concurrent aware, but you don't have to write the code. Another nice thing is that the structure of the sequential versus parallel code in streams is almost identical. So as we saw a number of times, you might have a stream that's sequential, and the effort required to convert it to a parallel stream is minuscule. You may just have to change whatever method created the stream in the first place to be a parallel stream, going from stream to parallel stream, or using the dot .parallel or dot .sequential transformer calls to change the semantics of stream concurrency. So that's, that's good. As you saw in some of the other examples, by writing the code properly using various kinds of custom splitterators, you can also toggle back and forth between sequential and parallel approaches very easily as well. So the point here is that by building abstractions that you can parameterize and customize, you can shield the bulk of your code from knowledge of whether parallelism is being used at all. And that's really cool, because that allows you to write the code first using sequential logic just to get it working. And then you can typically flip a switch, and boom, you get a big speed up, which is great. So in a nutshell, you know, what is Streams doing? It's simplifying your parallel programming by 
shielding you, the application developer, from all the details of how you split stuff up, how you apply it in parallel, how you combine the results, how things run, how they get mapped to the underlying fork join pool, that's all handled for you automatically, which is great. Hopefully you also got a sense, especially from the more sophisticated examples, things like the, the image stream gang example that we looked at, how parallel streams demonstrates the power of combining the functional programming paradigm and its emphasis on you know, lambda expressions and stateless method references and so on. In one, on one hand, with more classic object-oriented program structure capabilities or structuring capabilities. So what do you get here? The object-oriented design techniques give you the ability to structure your code in a way that makes it easier to understand by modularizing things, easier to reuse and extend by using subclassing to customize the existing code and fill in different hook methods with different behaviors based on what it is you're trying to do lower down in the inheritance hierarchy. So you can see, for example, that the search stream gang and the image stream gang examples we looked at had a lot of base uh, behavior that was common in, in super classes, and then we would customize those through extensions in Java in order to override and customize certain capabilities to do other things, uh, mostly changing the concurrency and parallelism strategy, but you could do other stuff as well. What functional programming gives you is the ability to close the gap between the domain intent and the computations that express that domain intent. So domain intent is what problem you're trying to solve. It's the requirements, the, the functional requirements that you're trying to address. And the computations, of course, are the things that do the work. And by using streams and parallel streams, you can make it pretty straightforward to kind of read the code from top to bottom, illustrating how it is it that the various processing gets done in the right order, in the right way, with the right logic. So that is a big win because you don't have to write loops, you don't have to write conditions, you kind of handle stuff, and, and for the most part, you can kind of read top to bottom seeing what the behavior of the program is. So it's much more clear what the behavior is based on the functional programming structure using the streams framework. So that's, that's also a really cool benefit. Of course, you know, not everything is unicorns and rainbows. There are downsides, there are limitations with parallel streams. And it's important to understand them if you're going to be an effective programmer who gets the most out of what they're doing. So let's take a look at some of those problems. One of the main issues is that not everything is easily expressed in the form of the split, apply, combine model of parallelism. So that's um, a particular way of doing things. It's for problems that lend themselves to divide and conquer style approaches where you can split a big problem up into smaller problems and then map those smaller problems evenly and efficiently to different cores to run in parallel. If you have a problem like that, parallel streams are great. Not everything is like that. Unfortunately, some things just don't have that particular structure or you, you can't easily split them up in a, in a sensible way. By the way, does anybody know what the, uh, what the image here is? This little guy here, what is that representing? I'll give you a hint, it's from Greek mythology. Nobody? A bunch of engineering students? Nobody here is taking classical, uh, classical civilization? Uh, that's a Procrustean bed. Does anybody remember the myth of Procrustus? So Procrustus was this innkeeper who would generously give people a place to stay for little or no charge. But the problem was that he had a bed called the Procrustean bed. And the goal was, his goal was to make you fit into the Procrustean bed. So if your legs were too long, he would chop them off. If you were too short, he'd stretch you. And uh, that's a metaphor for you know, not having things fit appropriately, right? So if something doesn't fit into this model, it's going to be rather painful, just like the Procrustean bed. OK. Um, Another problem, of course, is if the behaviors that you're writing in the stream aren't thread safe, then various race, race conditions can occur. And hopefully you remember what race conditions are there. The problems that arise when your program depends on the order or sequence or timing of the threads execution in order to get the right results. So pretty much any case where you're trying to access mutable shared state from multiple threads, especially updating it in parallel, 
you'll have problems if you don't synchronize your code. You'll end up with the race conditions. So be careful. Uh, or either partition your code to not need any of the synchronizers or use the appropriate synchronizers. Another thing that is worth noting, writing parallel splitterators may be tricky. We talked about that example in the context of the search stream gang phrase match splitterator that had to be very carefully designed to avoid splitting up the input strings in chunks where the phrases would span the chunks. So we had to be very clever in how we handled that. You can go back and watch that video if you forgot the details of it, but um, that's tricky. Fortunately, not everything is like that. Um, conversely, concurrent collectors are often much easier to write. So it's writing a very complicated parallel splitterator can be tricky, but a concurrent collector is often very simple, and you can usually leverage something like a concurrent hash map or some kind of concurrent uh, list or concurrent array to, to work fine for that. Another interesting quirk, which I, I don't fully understand, well, I understand why they did it that way, I don't understand why they don't make it easier to customize it, is that all the parallel streams in a process share a common fork join pool by default. So you've got lots and lots and lots of, potentially lots and lots of streams, parallel streams, all using the same pool. Interestingly enough, Java 8 completable futures, which we'll talk about next, don't have this limitation. You can have your own custom pool that is unique to your particular usage of a completable future uh, chain. So we'll talk more about that shortly. It, it just gives you a bit more flexibility. By default, of course, it uses the common fork joint pool, but it is possible to override that if you choose. Because of this, because of the fact that you've got this common pool for parallel streams, it's probably a good idea to learn how to use and how to apply managed blockers. And remember, the managed blockers are the things that will kind of manage the life cycle of threads, increasing the size of the threads in the pool. If you're going to be blocking, we talked about the blocking factors last time. And then they also are responsible for removing threads if they've been running for um, too long without being accessed. Naturally, this goes back to the whole issue of the n times q model. There will be some overhead from using splitterators. There will be some overhead from using the fork join framework. There will be some overhead from joining everything back together again at the end. And that's just par for the course. So you have to understand whether your application can tolerate that amount of overhead. And if n times q is big enough, it just doesn't matter. Um, there's a really funny article here that goes on and on and on about how the fork join framework is like the spawn of the devil and all this kind of stuff. Um, I think it was wildly overstated, but it is pretty funny to read it. Because uh, this, apparently this, the person who wrote this article, supposedly, I don't really know this for sure, but he was, had a business that was building custom parallel frameworks in Java. And when the fork join framework came along, his business must have dropped off because people said, oh, well, there's already one in here and it does everything we need, so we'll stop buying it from you, your custom proprietary solution. And he was very upset about that. So he wrote um, sort of a polemic a manifesto describing how bad the fork join framework is. And I, I don't really, uh, you know, for perhaps some really specialized use cases, he might be right. But in the vast majority of the cases, it just doesn't matter. And um, you're probably much better off using the fork join framework underneath streams or completable futures. And for the most part, it's really hard to tell any difference. However, having said that, there are situations where completable futures are a win relative to using parallel streams. And I foreshadowed that last time when we talked about the performance of the parallel version of the fork join, or sorry, of the image stream gang example. But uh, we'll look at that more when we talk about completable futures, and you'll see why it had a bigger win uh, for those cases. Of course, you know, your mileage may vary, so make sure that whenever you start looking at code, trying to figure out how to make it run faster, that you don't just rely on the n times q model, you know, some kind of mathematical heuristic, but you actually get in there and do a thorough job of, of benchmarking. And there's a nice framework called the Java Micro Benchmark Harness, JMH, which I've always thought was a goofy name, but that's the name of it, JMH. And that's something that you might use if you want to help micro benchmark your solutions to see if they work better or worse. Okay, and then I think um, 
The takeaway point from this is that there's a trade-off between how fast the computer hardware is going to run versus how productive you will be as a human trying to program the computer hardware. You know, back in the day, back 50 years ago, computer time was really precious, so people spent a lot of human time doing optimized things by hand to get the computer to run faster. Increasingly, that's not as much the case. Human time is often more important, depending on what kind of thing you're doing, of course, but human time is often the premium. And so if you can write with frameworks that give you good performance quickly in terms of productivity from a human point of view, it's usually a win. So even though completable futures will give you higher performance, they are a little harder to program. So you might stick with the stream approach, uh, even though it's not the optimized way every time, it's usually pretty good for most cases. Okay, so that is almost the end. Take a look at this book if you want more good information about Java, parallel streams, and all kinds of things about Java 8. And that's the end of that discussion.